Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuro Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Si Chaitana Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Shwayam Rupa Gadamayam Dharati Shapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Here we say Sasadhyavari Paschacha Dasatarine Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nathananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhaktivinoda So we're back in Alachua. Today is October something. I am ignorant of the date, which Prabhupada said was kind of craziness. But I believe it's October 4th. I'm not that crazy. So I was going to talk about Damodar, and what I was thinking of doing was reading from the Bhagavatam and then reading... Uh, I have a book of the commentary by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and reading his commentary. But something happened yesterday that um, changed my mind. And also, I had already discussed this last year at this time. We went through the whole Dhammadar Leela and we have this whole series of classes which are on my SoundCloud, which I recommend. It was based on a book by, Gira, um, by Shivaram Swami who, who did a very thorough study of all the commentaries on this Leela and presented those commentaries. So um, anything you like about that class um, all goes to the credit of Shivaram Swami for enlightening us. That was an ama- it's an amazing book about specifically only about that Leela. And so we cover that well. I would like I would like to cover it again when something happened yesterday and I thought I would take what happened yesterday and talk about it. So, yesterday morning I was watching, just, you know, how sometimes when you're online a video comes up. So I was watching a video, which was a discussion between Bhakti Raghava Swami, who's very much into Varnashram and farming communities and self-sufficiency, and Balabhadra Prabhu, who's the founder of IS, the International Society for Cow Protection who's been taking care of cows and bulls for decades and promoting that. And so we had a meeting yesterday, a community meeting in Alachua, and Balabhadra was there. And when, he, when I was coming, he was also coming, and I said, oh, I just was watching a video of you with Bhakti Raghava Swami, and you were saying this and that. And then we started talking. He was talking about cows, and, you know, should Hare Krishnas be vegan or shouldn't they be vegan? And um, he started telling me some things. And he quoted a purport in which Prabhupada said that all the problems that we face in the world today are because we're not protecting cows. And he said, he said um, you know, there's a lot to this, as, as we say in America, more than... There's more to this than meets the eye. And so we started discussing, and the meeting started, and he said, we should talk more. And he said, I'll write down some places in Gita and Bhagavatam you should read. Uh, um, so, he gave me the references. Here they are. What I thought is we could read the references. Because I think most of us who grew up in cities, although we've read something about cows, and we've seen them, especially when you drive on the highway, you see them, but probably most of us never interacted much with them or thought much about them or thought much about what Prabhupada said about them. Um, And I had the opportunity of living in Mayapur, and there are many cows there, and I would go to the Goshala, 
at least once, twice a week. Uh, I would give class right across from the Goshala, and I would always go there, or sometimes in Japa walks I would go there and spend a bit of time. So I can't say I know a lot about cows, but I know more about cows than I did before I was a devotee. Because I had no interaction with a cow before I was a devotee, except once a year in my grammar school when I was <clears throat> maybe 10 or 8 or so. They would bring a cow and do some cow kata, so to speak. I can't remember what they said. But we did learn that cows give milk. That's about it. And we saw them milk the cow. And, and that's all we knew. So, with your permission, or maybe without it, because I'm sure you're happy one way or the other. Um, you're probably not happy because you want to hear Dhammadar Leela, right? Well, as I said, you can hear it on my SoundCloud. There are many, many classes we gave. So this is going to be um, maybe slightly disconcerting to you because I'm not prepared and I have to find the verses, although it won't take long. But I think it'll be interesting for us. And uh, this, this gives us... Um, it's just references that maybe aren't directly talking about the cow, but also it gives us some uh, chance to read Prabhupada's book. So this is 926. This verse is the verse where Krishna says, Patra Pushpam Palam Toyam, offer me fruit, flower, water. Yome Bhakta Prachati, with Bhakti, and then I will accept it. <clears throat> Ashnami, if it's offered with love. So I want to find, um, I'll need to find, it's a long purport, um, why Balabhadra Prabhu was referring to this purport. There must be something about milk. Um, and I'm looking. Okay, I think I see something. One who loves Krishna will give him whatever he wants and he avoids offering anything which is undesirable or unasked. Unasked. Asked. Unasked. Thus meat, fish, and eggs should not be offered to Krishna. If he desired such things as offerings, he would have said so. Instead, he clearly requests that a leaf, fruit, flower, and water be given. And he says, of this offering I will accept it. Therefore, we should understand that he will not accept meat, fish, and eggs. <clears throat> Vegetables, grains, fruits, milk, and water are the proper foods. For a human being, pres <clears throat> we were talking, uh, he was giving me these quotes because I had once seen him in Vrindavan, and he was with another devotee, Kormarupa, who passed away maybe three, four years ago. And Kormarupa was taking care of abandoned cows or sick cows, cows that people didn't want or... Sometimes he'd find them wandering or someone would come and give a sick cow. They couldn't take care of him, them. So they were both together. And this vegan issue was uh, puzzling me or bothering me. Or I, I never really thought about it in depth. And, and sometimes when you don't think about something, you just come up with kind of an emotional response. Like there's no way devotees should be vegan because that's kind of demoniac. That's kind of the gut reaction you would get. Um, so I saw them both standing there and I said can I ask you a question what is your take on veganism because I have heard devotees argue both sides of the aisle on this issue and here are people who take care of cows so I thought well they're the best people to ask because they have the greatest insight I mean they've been taking care of cows for years and so I so they both said, they both said we're both vegan, unless we can get milk from protected cows. And I said, why? And he said, because when you take care of cows, you, you find it impossible emotionally to support an industry which would kill cows. Now, of course, some people say, well, you know, the, the milk can be offered to Krishna, so it's kind of demoniac to be vegan, and that milk can be offered to Krishna. Uh, that's true. Uh, it's also another argument. 
I think they were speaking more from a personal level. It wasn't a philosophical level. It said, I can't do this because I feel that I'm supporting the slaughter of innocent animals. And yes, the milk could be offered, but there's not that many, you know, it's, by drinking milk, it's not like there's, it's just a small percentage of cows that might be benefited by offering their milk to Krishna. So, I think the reason he cited this verse was just because I'd asked that question about being vegan. And so he's saying, look at here. It's clear, it's clear that milk is something we should offer to Krishna. But I would like to substantiate, at least my understanding, is that a lot of the milk that we get in America, it's not really the milk that's referred to here or that Prabhupada's referring to or that Ayurveda refers to because that milk is, aside from what we would call blood milk, it's being given by cows who are raised for slaughter. There are also cows which are not purely bred. And so they're like genetically, it's like genetically modified food. When it's genetically modified, for example, wheat is very, very harmful. It's very unhealthy if it's genetically modified. And I have personal experience because if I eat wheat, it makes me very tired. And wherever my body would tend to ache, it definitely aches when I eat wheat. But when I don't eat wheat, then after the meal, generally I'm not that tired. Usually, at least not as tired as I would be if I were eating meat. And those places that ache, either they don't ache or they don't ache much. But... I had found out that the wheat they use in Europe is not genetically modified, and I wanted to test it, and the best test was eat it and see what happens. And I ate it, and I didn't get tired. I said, oh, this wheat must be different. So in the same way, I made another test with milk. I don't digest milk. It gives me, it gives me diarrhea. But if I get milk from a purebred Indian cow, not genetically modified, boil the milk and drink it, I have no problem. So that also showed me that my theory was correct, that this milk is different, it has a different effect on my body. So you could say, what, what is your authority? Uh, well, Adhoksha just says, Rig Veda says milk forced from cows causes incurable disease. Well, there's also, um, there's also something very interesting happened when I was in Mayapur that I read, I read, on the internet, a list of diseases that milk causes. As, as we know, uh, as you probably know, naturopathic doctors who recommend a vegan or a vegetarian diet generally do not recommend milk products, although sometimes they, they say that ghee is healthy, but other milk products are not, and that milk is not meant for humans and so forth. We find in Ayurveda, pretty much the exact opposite, that milk is a nectar, it's used in so many medicines, it's used with certain herbs, it can cure certain diseases. Uh, you could live on milk, sadhus used to live on milk, milk and fruit. Prabhupada said you could live on milk and fruit. So, um, and then it, it gave a list of all the diseases it cures, which was basically all the diseases that that other list said milk created. So how that could be, my only conclusion was that they must be talking about a different kind of milk. And in my discussions with learned Ayurvedic physicians, I would ask them about the, the processed foods that Ayurveda says are healthy, and, they would, and, and those Ayurvedic physicians who had did a little research and see how the foods were processed Said, them to, said to me, I don't eat those foods because they're processed in certain ways. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's important. So generally, as far as the vegan and, uh, argument is concerned, uh, many, many devotees feel that the, the proper thing to do is to take milk, and I would say take milk from pure, pure, purely bred purely bred cows, take milk from purely bred cows, which are protected. That would be the ideal. Anything less than that, you may or may not do. 
but that's the ideal that um, and I, I understood I understood and maybe someone correct me maybe Katrina you know I understood that in England one of the things they have done with the cows who have dried up or maybe even other cows is find a farmer who takes care of cows and pay him to maintain those cows in other words we don't have the land or facility to maintain a large herd of cows, but we can give those cows to another person and pay them for the cost of maintaining them. And so that way the cows are protected, They're not, they won't be killed. And or if you're wealthy, you would pay, or maybe this is what they're doing, they're paying that farmer who was going to send those cows to slaughter, pay him what he would make from the cow and what it would cost him to maintain the cow. So let's say he'd make $1,000 and to maintain the cow for the rest of our life would cost 4000 So we would pay them 5000 and say, don't kill the cow, maintain it, and we'll pay you 5000 for this cow. So if you have the money, that's wonderful seva. Now, as Prabhupada said, all the all the problems in the world are coming from the lack of protection of cows. That's a, that's a, a powerful statement. Uh, um, oh yeah, okay. So my sister says, the baby cow is killed when it's born so the mother can have more milk and she is immediately milked this way with her child being immediately separate. Yeah, Prabhupada talks about that in his books. They're given tons of antibiotics and other hormones which make you crazy. Yeah. Tons of antibiotics. This is commercial farming that most people aren't aware of. Yeah. And plus, they're given... <laughs> I, I read that most of the antibiotics that are produced, at least in America, maybe 80% are fed to the cows. Plus, whatever else they're feeding them. I want to tell you something. Um, you reminded me of something, which is very interesting. It's not Maybe not so common, but it does happen. Generally, we understand that a mother, the mother lactates, human or other animals, cow lactates when she has a baby to feed the baby. And the vegans say that cow milk is not meant for humans, it's meant for the baby. And those who take care of cows know that the cow has more milk than the baby needs, and if the baby drank everything, the baby would get sick. That's, that's common knowledge amongst people in the dairy industry. A lot of vegans say, no, that's, it's all the milk is meant for the, for the calf, or the cow produces extra milk in case the calf needs more. But as far as I've understood, from people who take care of cows and also from the Vedas, that's not actually the case. But, and so, but let's say that were the case, just for the sake of argument. I just heard yesterday about a cow, um, maybe Balabhadra was talking about a cow because when they were having this conversation, they were also with the cows in the barn. And he said, this cow, I believe it was eight years the cow was giving milk after the birth of her calf. So the calf doesn't, I don't know how long calves milk, but obviously not eight years. Maybe we could say, let's say a year or even two. He said, this cow was giving milk for eight years. And I also found out when I was in Vrindavan We went to see one of our god brothers, and he said the same thing. He said, this cow keeps giving milk. I said, why? And she said, "Um, we give her so much affection, we give all the cows so much affection, that that motherly feeling to give back is there, and so she's giving us milk, which is quite interesting. I was thinking, yeah, you give people affection, they give back. Everyone wants affection. Everyone needs affection. Everyone loves affection. And when you give people affection, they give back, which is what Prabhupada did for us. He gave us so much affection. And we wanted to give back so much. So, but there is, so there, I'm sure there are many more examples of cows giving long after their calves need milk because they feel the affection 
of their owners. So I think that's an important point, which you can explain to vegans it's, that some cows do give milk even when their calves don't need it. And they're giving to humans. Cows aren't stupid. <clears throat> There's a nice story. I don't know if I told this before, but it's a very interesting story. <clears throat> when Prabhupada was ill in Vrindavan, he asked the devotees, he said, bring a cow and tie the cow up outside my room. And they said, why? And he said, because the cow will pray for me, because the cow is a mother, and the cow will pray for my health. That's amazing. So that means the cow would know, Prabhupada is sick, that she's smart enough to know, and that she would pray. So, so based on that, we can understand that the intuition, intelligence, awareness of cows may be greater than we think. So I think it's safe to assume when the cow was giving milk and she didn't have a calf, she knew who she was giving the milk to. She knows that humans were taking her milk. Now, it's interesting, the vegan argument is interesting because the vegans say cow's milk is not for humans, where the Ayurveda, which is of course a very ancient scripture of medicine, says cow's milk is one of, I think there's seven or eight nectars in Ayurveda. Ghee is one, almonds. Almonds is a nectar, sugarcane juice is a nectar. And these nectars are considered um, foods which are, which, which are yeah, nectar for the body, very, very healthy. So, as I said, um, that's a different kind of milk. And it's something which is very, very healthy and which is vital, according to Ayurveda, that there are the nutrients, or as Prabhupada said, all the nutrients that we need are in milk, which is why sages lived on it. And they didn't get sick. So, in understanding the vegan argument, we have to understand that there is a different kind of milk, and for thousands of years, these sadhus who lived in the forest may have only had one or two cows and you know just local, what was growing wild locally, and so basically they were subsisting on cow, on cow milk. And then Prabhupada says, you probably know this, he said that in ancient times, sadhus, they would tend to travel from place to place. And their, their service was twofold. They would Traveling was austere. They would live in the forest and travel. But they would travel also to teach. And one of the things they would do is every morning they would go to someone's home. And in those days, cows were like cars. Like today, everyone has a car. In those days, everyone had cows. I was in Mauritius in 1982. I went there. And if you go to the village... Everyone had a garage, but there wasn't a car in it. There was a cow in it. Nobody had cars. Very few people had cars, but everyone had cows. So it's kind of common, even up, that was, you know, 35 years ago or so, 36 years ago. So that was even common 36 years ago. Interesting, right? So the sadhus would go to people's homes because the sadhus had nothing to eat and they would beg for milk. And so the understanding is, they were living solely on milk or primarily on milk because at least Prabhupada didn't say they were begging for anything else. He said they're only begging for milk, which, which would then demonstrate that that milk is not the milk that the vegans are talking about because that milk was sustaining these sadhus. They lived very healthy lives off this milk. So the milk wasn't creating disease or giving them heart attacks and cancer or whatever. It was, it was actually preventing those things from happening, which is interesting. So that information is um, necessary. So the, the, what I call the GMO cows, it's not normally what you call it, but I call it GMO cows. The GMO cows are producing a different kind of milk, just as GMO grains or GMO food is different, as far as I understand, at least the effect on the body is different. The genetic modification is, is such that it's not healthy. So, Balabhadra Prabhu told me to read this verse because I asked the question about veganism, and there it is. You should offer milk to Krishna. Okay, so then the next question is, what kind of milk? Now, he says verse 27 also. 
Um, I'm looking. If there's anything about cows here. Mm. It's basically offering, you know, <clears throat> like people would ask us, well, why milk? And we would say, because Krishna likes it and everything we eat we offer to Krishna. That's why. So, yeah, that's why we offer milk. I think that's the point. He's just making that point that as devotees, Krishna likes milk, so then can we get real milk from, from real cows who aren't going to be slaughtered? Can we get that? That's, that's the first consideration. And what to do if you can't get it? That becomes an individual decision for the devotees. Of course, then the question has come up, and I'm supposed to ask the deity minister, the deity worship minister. I will ask him this question. I'm just remembering now. This came up in Mexico. If we can't get milk from protected cows and milk from cows that aren't being fed lots of antibiotics and hormones, because that milk is, it's, you know, we're, we're take well, it's twofold. You know, we're supporting the slaughter of animals, and that milk, even though we offer it, it's um, full of, it's, is that milk offerable? Because it's basically poisoned. And um, could we substitute it, like with coconut milk or almond milk or like, that's an interesting question. So I'm going to <clears throat> ask a deity worship minister. I think he'll probably say, no, we can't, but you should try to get pure milk. Um, when Prabhupada was here, we offered some pretty impure milk. And Prabhupada said his answer was, which maybe the answer the deity worship minister would give us is, you know, obviously you want to offer the purest thing. Oh yeah, and said hoax, it just says homogenizing it makes it indigestible. But nobody was telling Prabhupada these things, and Prabhupada was just saying all the milk's contaminated. He said everything in Kali Yuga, you, it's hard to find something pure unless you're growing it yourself. And then you might be growing it in land that's been poisoned by the farms around you that are using pesticides. Because <laughs> I have this unfortunate experience. We were trying to grow organically, and so what happened was all the farms around us, this was in Mauritius, were using pesticides. So that would keep the pests away. So where do you think the pests would come? They'd come to our land because we weren't spraying. So we got all the pests. This is one of the problems when everyone's not organic. I don't think it was a really big problem before they introduced organic farming in Mauritius. It became a problem afterwards. So once you buy into the system now, you have to go through it. <clears throat> and then he says, text 28. Let's look at 28. Um, I guess in this verse, Krishna is saying that you become free from all impious and pious deeds. I think, I think he's saying that, okay, being vegan would be pious, but it's not really what Krishna wants. Um, because his point was, vegan, it's good, obviously it's good to be a vegan because animals are being protected, but that we are meant to use milk and milk products, real milk, because Krishna wants it, and we use it in our in worship. It's, it's an integral part of our worship. And if you can make ghee, <clears throat> this is how you make ghee, you get a purebred cow, <clears throat> You make yogurt from the milk. You make butter from the yogurt, which gives you buttermilk, which is super healthy. And then from that butter, you make ghee. That's real ghee. Anything else, it's not ghee. And that ghee, wow, that would probably even make my hair grow. That ghee is like powerful stuff. That's real ghee. Uh, I think a lot of temples were not using real ghee <clears throat> in the name of we should cook with ghee. It may be something far from that ghee that was, you know, that we're talking about in scripture. 
<clears throat> of course, we can always say, as Prabhupada said, <clears throat> everything's impure. But I think now we know more about how impure it is, or maybe now it's more impure. And so for us, it's, you know, I, want to, I think it was Anuradha was saying, but one of the factors is that this milk is, is so polluted now, is that, and we're offering it to Didi, and we're all taking preparations made with milk products, but it's, it's very unhealthy for us. Um, so that's a, I think that's something to consider also, the impurity of the milk. And that's it. of course that's an impetus to have our own cows and produce our own food. I also noticed in, when I was in <clears throat> when I was in Mexico, at least Mexico City, the food actually tasted pretty much like water. Meaning, I think it was grown in earth that had been t entirely depleted. And then we went to another city and it, we could uh, tell the difference in taste. Okay, we're going to go to 1844. Right, on Arata? We went to Uapan. And the food actually tasted like, it actually tasted like food. Which is kind of strange to say that. The food in Uapan actually tasted like food. But the food in Mexico City actually tasted pretty much like water. Like you could, we could make you some different vegetables. And say, close your eyes. And can you taste the difference? And it would be like very slight. It wouldn't be like so. Is this a carrot? I'm, it has the texture of a carrot, but it doesn't have much taste. Is this, is this squash? It has the texture of squash, but it kind of tastes the same as the carrot, which basically means neither of them had much taste. That's my experience. <clears throat> so, and then we were, we were discussing that, that, that now, with the, the quote-unquote advancement of civilization, we're drinking milk, which is full of antibiotics and hormones and who knows what, other medicines. We're eating vegetables that are covered with pesticides that don't actually give us the nutrients we need. It's so sad. And, um, and people are becoming, people are developing diseases which probably would have been prevented if they just had nutritious food. So Katie says, how to find a balance in making preparations for Krishna. The price per pint of Hings and milk is ten times higher. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Well, in the temple, yes, you, you have to follow a certain standard. At home, um, you can create your own standard. You can make milk sweets out of almond milk or coconut milk. or I don't know if Krishna likes soy milk. <laughs> I would stay away from soy milk. I think Krishna likes coconut milk. Of course, coconut milk. We're, we bought some butter, vegan butter. It's more expensive than real butter. <laughs> it tastes like real butter. It's some special brand. Anyway, Katie, I don't know what to do. If I were you, maybe um, I would offer... I wouldn't worry about um, offering a lot of milk preparations. Um, go online and read how your cows are raised to make that milk and what's in the milk. You probably wouldn't want to offer it. Okay, famous verse, 1844, Bhagavad Gita. Krishi Gorakshavani jam vaisha karma jam makam karma sudasyapi sobhava jam. So, farming cow protection, and business are the natural work for Vaishyas. This is so interesting. Vaishyas are the mercantile class. And so we see the mercantile class today is much different than it was in olden times and much different than what is prescribed here. Three things are being prescribed. Growing food, protecting cows, and that also means milk, and the cow, the bulls, not tractors. So... Um, in an in industrialized society, it was not recommended in the Vedas, and so you had the bulls to plow the land, maybe in some places horses. You have cows for milk, you have the bull and cow dung for fertilizer. You grow your vegetables. And then, what was the other business of the Vaishyas? 
to sell the vegetables or to in um, that was that was basically their business or maybe to to market the work uh, the crafts and work of other people it, it's not elaborated that much basically it's agriculture and marketing agriculture there may be other aspects generally we see the business mentality is there but it wasn't a broad thing like it is today with investments and multinational companies and that, that was never the concept of business just as if there's any industrialization of any kind of manufacturing process the industrialization was probably like a, going from a rock to a hammer it wasn't big because when you industrialize then it requires you you know exploiting the earth for mass production of products that maybe people don't need and then creating factories to produce them and then causing thousands or probably hundreds of millions of people to work in factories which are kind of a degrading kind of work monotonous and so forth so that wasn't recommended and it's hard for us to understand these things because we weren't raised in a society like that but let's read the purport there is no purport so we can't read it okay um, there's no purport but that is that was the job or is the job there are purports in the Bhagavatam okay so now we're going to go to the Bhagavatam and we're going to read maybe some things that are a little heavier Prabhupada is going to talk directly now about the cow because this, these parts of the Bhagavatam directly refer to the cow. So this is one sixteen eighteen. I was thinking it would be really good uh, next week if we could just bring Balabhadra Prabhu here. He lives in Alachra and say, why don't you come and talk about the cows and if any of you or I have questions or I could interview him We'll get it straight from the, not the horse's mouth, the cow's, the cowherd boy's mouth directly, because I think me speaking and him speaking, it's like he's climbed Mount Everest, and I've read books about climbing Mount Everest. It's, it's going to be different. Okay. 116.18, this is the translation. The personality of religious principles, Dharma, that's the bull, because the bull represents religion. The bull is sometimes called Dharma. It represents religion. That's so interesting. The bull was wandering about. The personality of religious principles, Dharma, was wandering about in the form of a bull. And he met the personality of earth in the form of a cow who appeared to grieve like a mother who had lost her child. She had tears in her eyes and the beauty of her body was lost. Thus Dharma questioned her, excuse me, questioned the earth as follows. So... As I remember, the cow, there's an attempt to kill the cow, and this had never happened before. And the cow was very aggrieved. This was by the personality of Kali, the person who personifies the degradation of Kali Yuga, was trying to kill the cow. And so the cow was aggrieved, and the cow represents the earth, Mother Earth, takes the form of the cow. Religion is in the form of the bull. So let's read the purport. The bull is the emblem of the moral principle and the cow is the representative of the earth. When the bull and cow are in a joyful mood, it is to be understood that the people of the world are also in a joyful mood. That is so interesting, isn't it? Like who, who, would, who on their own would understand that unless... They had some connection to cows and bulls. And even in modern society, people, at least outside of India or outside of Vedic culture, wouldn't understand this because they feel it's natural to raise cows for slaughter. That's just business. So I'm going to read that again. That is like T-shirt worthy. When the bull and the cow are in a joyful mood, it is to be understood that the people of the world are also in a joyful mood. Or... Like, Obviously what Prabhupada means is that when the cow and the bull are protected, then the people in the world will be happy. 
You have to meditate on that because, you know, this is subtle. This is a subtle connection. Like, okay, well, let's try to explain it. In a house, you probably know if your mother's upset, everything's bad. If your mother's happy, everything's cool. Do you have that experience? Like, if your mother gets upset about something, it's like everybody becomes tense. It's not happy in the house. But if your mother's happy, it's, it's like the woman of the house is happy. It makes things easier for everybody. And generally, everyone's a little lighter and happier when the mother's happy. I mean, you could say that about the father, but I think more so about the mother, at least in my experience. Um, male emotions tend to be more stable. So, you know, men don't usually, we don't have this experience so much with men just going really, really upset. <clears throat> but at least my experience is it's more common with women. It's not a criticism, just an observation. But let's just use it as an example because I'm, I'm, it does happen. At least in my life, it happened with my mother. I saw sometimes she'd get very upset and it would, everyone in the house would kind of like lock themselves in their room as I remember. <clears throat> At least that's what I did. So it was an uneasy atmosphere. So if the cow's happy and the bull is happy, everyone's happy. People don't know this. They don't know why they're not happy, what's going on, but this is something to meditate on. It's very, I think, very profound. The reason is that the bull helps production of grains in the agricultural field and the cow delivers milk, the miracle of aggregate food values. The human society, therefore, maintains these two important animals very carefully so that they can wander everywhere in cheerfulness. So in other words, my sister knows about the angry mother. So, um, kind of like a tornado in the house. Yeah. Um, but Prabhupada here is being specific. I was kind of getting esoteric. Prabhupada's being specific. The bulls are happy. They work hard. They're your tractors. They produce the food. Cows give milk. Now everybody's got, society is happy. We have beautiful food, beautiful milk. Wow. What more could you ask for? We can't even get good milk and good food anymore. Then you might be thinking, well, what's the, you know, how can society be happy just with good food and good milk? Well, try it out. <laughs> get some good food. I've lived on farms and got some good food and good milk, and I can say, yeah. You'll be happy with good food and good milk, even without a, the latest iPhone. Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's interesting. Have you ever been on a farm and like got the fresh food and just eaten it, and you like you become happy? It's so good, isn't it? It's like wow, this meal is amazing. It was just came out of the earth like a half hour ago, and it's so fresh and delicious and natural, and the milk. We just got this milk a half hour ago and we boiled it and wow. It doesn't taste like the food you buy in the store. And you get nutrients and yeah, yeah I knew, I knew you were going to say that. We, when I visit my sister, we go to this place and they've got like all kinds of apple trees and you get the fresh apples and they're, they're not like ordinary apples. And you just like, you feel happy after eating those apples. It's like, kind of like, it's almost like a drug, you know. Wow, we got some real food. That was like the first time in about 12 years I actually ate a real apple. That's amazing. I feel really good. Isn't it? <laughs> Jai Parsaram. But at the present moment in this age of Kali, both the bull and the cow are now being slaughtered and eaten up as foodstuff by a class of men who do not know the Brahminical culture. The bull and the cow can be protected for the good of all human society simply by spreading a Brahminical culture as the topmost perfection of all cultural affairs. So Brahminical culture means, what Prabhupada means by that, at least in, um, what Prabhupada means by that is that when there was Brahminical culture, the Brahmins, the priestly class, the educated class, the intelligent class, the sadhu class, would direct the government. 
And so they would direct the government based on Vedic principles. So obviously they wouldn't allow the slaughter of animals. So if there's a Brahminical culture, well, they're very <laughs> concerned about who are the leaders. So, you know, this is a different concept. We're, we're, we're all for democracy and, and consensus and consent and all that. And it's probably the lesser of all the other evils that we can deal with. Because who would, who would allow a class of Brahmins to make all the decisions? But in that society, people understood, well, the Brahmins are just representing scripture. And, and Vedic scripture was not, it wasn't a religion. Oh, it wasn't Hindu. It was just these are the scriptures that were given to guide human society. And so the Brahmins understand the scripture. They study them. They teach them. And they ensure that the Chatriya or the administrators follow those scriptures. So if there's Brahminical culture, then cows are protected. That's the, that's the law. They're not allowed to be killed. They can be eaten if the animal, if they die naturally. That's okay. And the leather can be used when they die naturally, but they are protected until their natural death. And so if you have Brahmins who are advisors, that's what they would advise and therefore cows can be protected. That's what Prabhupada means. The bull and the cow can be protected for the good of all human society simply by spreading of a Brahminical culture as the topmost perfection of all cultural affairs. By advancement of such culture, the morale of society is properly maintained, and so peace and prosperity are also attained without extraneous effort. Now, now the Prabhupada is saying indirectly, or maybe you see it directly, that if you maintain bulls and cows, human society will prosper. Why? Because this is right, and Krishna will be pleased. If he's pleased, then everything is good. If he's not pleased, everything is bad. Now, part of the problem with capitalism is capitalism kind of, um, not kind of, capitalism validates its success primarily by income. Or is your business successful? Well, we look at the, the accounts, and that tells us if we're successful or not. More by, but not by what, as much as what you've accomplished. Well, the accounts aren't good, but we accomplished this. Oh, well, that means we're a failure. So that's the, that's the way business works. At least in the modern sense, how can you run a business if there's not profit? And then profit becomes the main, main item. <clears throat> for many businesses, or for some businesses it's the only item. Obviously there are many businesses that are creating quality products and that's why they were created and they have to figure out how to make money doing it, but making of the money is not the only reason they're in business. It's what keeps them in business, but they're purpose-driven by something else. But in most businesses we can say ultimately the bottom line is the money. And so in Vedic culture the bottom line is dharma, what's right. And the Vedic, Vedic idea is if it's right, then the money will follow. The other idea in Vedic culture is you don't need that much money. Money is like you have land and cows, you don't need that much money. And you live in villages and so you, you can barter locally to get your pots and your clothes, you know, the bare necessities. It's part of the problem of our culture is that we've created this artificial standard that we need things that we don't need. And so, because we need things we don't need, we need a lot of money, and because we need a lot of money, you're not going to get enough just by living off your land. Whereas in traditional culture, you didn't need much. And like you still see in Indian villages, it's so interesting. <clears throat> I was telling this, I was mentioning this maybe a couple of years ago. You know, like if you go shopping at Walmart, and you have a bag like about this big, right? You know, you can say with groceries and maybe a t-shirt and some socks and like that, you know. You expect it's going to be between 20 and $30, which is, in that same bag at Whole Foods, you expect it's like going to be 60 That's usually Whole Foods is like, I just bought a few things. And why is it so expensive? So everything at Whole Foods tends to be expensive. I don't know now that Amazon bought them, maybe less. <clears throat> but for those of you who don't know, Whole Foods is a chain of natural food stores, huge, huge chain and huge stores, and they have 
high quality products at high quality prices. Yeah. So you go to Whole Foods, you, know, you get a little bag of something like this big, and it's like eighteen dollars, and a little big here. And you get up here, you're like at sixty. And you're like, what did I get? I just got four apples and two bananas and some toothpaste and deodorant and what else? A snack. And it's like I'm at like twenty four dollars. So <laughs> I was in. Mayapur, and there's a local store we go to, to buy the toothpaste, get the rice, get the sugar, get the bananas, the grapes, the potatoes, the this and that, you know. And then I got my bag, which included cheese and milk and, you know, everything, you know, spices. And I got my bag, and he's like... And he says, that's like, no, well, that'll be $5.25. And I'm like, did you add that again? Did you make a mistake? He answered, no, that's $5.25. So everything in Mayapur has grown within a you know, half a mile of that store. Of course, other things are brought in. But the, standard, the standards are different in India, standards of living. So when people are living in a village, simply they just don't have money. And so the products are all priced to be affordable, which they can be, it can be done in that situation. So you get a little taste of how you actually don't need much money to live. Like if you, if you go to Mayapur and you spend a thousand dollars a month, that's for everything, your rent, your medical, your food, vitamins, buy books, buy videos, whatever you want to do and you have a family of three, it's actually hard to spend that much money. You'd have to like, oh, I have $300 left over this month. I have to spend it. Yeah, I give a donation. Okay, I gave a donation. I spent my 1000 <clears throat> It's more like 700 is kind of normal for a family of three or four. Isn't that amazing? And that's paying your rent or mortgage, not like you've had a pay, your place is already paid for. And that's with, you know, having a scooter and buying gas and everything, and taxis and rickshaws. So there, that is possible. Yeah, so that's how we understand people live, Brahminical culture. So, Prabhupada, I was just reading off the statement, peace and prosperity are also attained without extraneous effort. When Brahminical culture deteriorates, the cow and the bull are mistreated, and the resultant actions are prominent by the following symptoms. And you want to read the symptoms? Um, well, the rest of the story is how Dharma, or the, the cow is unhappy, and um, Prabhupada, yeah, I think we should read this. He didn't even tell us to read this. Let me read the next chapter. First. Dharma in the form of the bull asks, Madam, are you not hale and hearty? What's the word for madam? Dharma uvacha inquired, Kaschit whether, Madre, Padre, Madam. Wow, that's so interesting. Padre means auspicious, Subhadra. Madam, are you not hale and hearty? Why are you covered with the shadow of grief? It appears by your face that you have become black. Are you suffering from some internal disease or are you thinking of some relative who is, far, who is away in a distant place? The people of the world in this age of Kali are always full of anxieties. Everyone is diseased with some kind of ailment. From the very faces of the people in, the, in this age, one can find out the index of the mind. Everyone feels the absence of his relative who is far from home the particular symptom of the age of Kali is that no family is now blessed to live together. To earn a livelihood, the father lives at a place far away from the son, or his wife lives away from the husband, and so on. There are sufferings from internal diseases, separation from those near and dear, and anxieties for maintaining the status quo. These are but some important factors which make the people of this age always unhappy. But one thing, this is like these ideas, they're quite revolutionary, but you can see the world is gradually going in this direction. It's going to take a while. I don't know if the whole world's going to wake up in our lifetime. But you can see the seeds for this. What is Prabhupada saying? 
He said this in other ways in different places. He's saying that traditionally most people would live in a village and they would work in that village either on their land or as a craft, generally as in that, most people would work as craftsmen or farmers. And then you'd have some Kshatriyas and a few Brahmins. And the Brahmins were the teachers, the astrologers, the doctors. And then the Kshatriyas actually, as you know, were the administrators. And then the Vaishyas would grow the food and run the business. And the Shudras would be manufacturing, the craftspeople who would the potters and the weavers and so forth. So all the food and all the necessities, or the majority of the necessities, I think, in ancient times, probably 90 plus percent of the necessities were in that village. So, you, you know, most people were farming, so their office was their farm, where they would go and do their work. Most likely their work was done in a little hut at home or a little place within the village a hundred yards down the road. That's how people lived. They weren't driving long distances to work and sitting inside under artificial lighting. So that's kind of what Prabhupada's referring to. It's like you, you get off the land, you, get, you, know, you kill the cow instead of protect it. The cow, you trade the bull in for tractors. You raise animals for beef. And then everything changes. And so then everybody moves off the land, they crowd into the cities, which is why cities are so crowded and they never were. Historically, that crowd, they weren't that crowded when people were farming. And of course, the population of the world is increasing. So, and now, in the city, the, the way people make money is much different than how they made it in the country. And so that whole system changed. So it brings people to the city, and now... As David Marita Swami said, the universities are factories to prepare you for working in factories. So the whole educational system has shifted to de- prepare people for that kind of life. So if you look at the problems in the world today, basically what Prabhupada's saying is they're all a result of moving away from the land, moving away from cow and bull protection. And when you don't do that, you have to create an artificial lifestyle, but the consequence of those comforts and ease are what we're seeing today in terms of disease, both emotional and physical, lack of spirituality, working very long hours, as Prabhupada's saying here, being away from family. There's a lot of people um, whose jobs keep them away from home, maybe five days a week. They're salesmen, they're off for... Um, entertainers are always gone. You know, there's so many jobs where you know, truckers are gone most of the week, like that. Airline, airline pli- pilots and, stu- you know, the whole... It's not like a, an old traditional system. Everybody's just like, you, you never leave your village. Hardly ever leave your village. You're there. And then your grandchildren living with you and your uncles and your aunts and your brothers and sisters and cousins. So it's like every farm is a bit like a it's a bit like a temple in a sense. It's a community. So it's a much different life. Now what's happening, and I see this all the time, and, and it's like, what can you do? Because you buy into a system that creates a problem. So what do you see happening today? You see a man and a woman with a kid, and the man's working and the woman's working because they don't have enough money for the woman to stay at home. So the woman has to work all day and then come home and take care of the kid and take care of the kid in the morning and the kid is being taken care of by someone else all day. Okay, that's pretty bad. It's bad for the kid and it's, it's just difficult, extremely difficult. It puts a lot of pressure on everyone. Why are they living that way? Well, they have a certain standard that, uh, of living and they need six, seven thousand dollars, eight thousand a month to live on that standard. If they live on a lower standard, maybe she wouldn't have to work. So that's one problem. You know, we have higher standards. Obviously the bigger problem is when the woman's by herself, abandoned by the man, which is extremely common. And we're running into that a lot. And this woman has to work and maintain a kid and it's kind of impossible. As opposed to the traditional system where you have this this extended family. So even if the husband is away or the husband died untimely, 
the woman is surrounded by her cousins and her aunts and her uncles and her grandparents. So it, she can function. She's not alone. So, you know, we move off the land, we move in, and then gradually the nuclear family takes over. Both, both people are working very, very hard. They don't have a lot of time for their kids. It's not healthy. You know, when I came home, my mother was home every day when I came home from school. I don't ever remember. I have no memory of coming into a house where nobody was there in my entire upbringing. I mean, I wish sometimes nobody was there so I could, you know, do mischief. But as long as someone was there, I couldn't do mischief. And she was always there. She didn't work. She didn't have to work. And that's why when you marry into an Indian family, even if you're a woman with a PhD, they expect you to be a housewife because that's the tradition. Of course, if you have a PhD, probably you'd rather use your PhD. But that was the tradition. That was just normally how it was done. You know, whatever Women were well-educated, but then they took on their role of mother and housewife. That was just the culture. And they didn't have a problem with it. They, they knew they were doing that. They, they were fine with it in general. So I think that's what pro one of the points Prophet's making here is when you move off the land, you, you know, we have to look at it, you know, if you look at it from now going back to the land, it looks like how can you do that? But if you look at it from what happened on the land to when they went off the land, it's easier to understand. Like going back to that's harder, but seeing what happened after they moved off, you go, oh, it's probably better they didn't move off the land. Now, we all know who've been to India because this has been happening. I think this is happening in India. First, we saw, you know, we saw this move off the land. Well, it wasn't happening first. No, no. What I'm trying to say is, now I know what I'm trying to say is, it was happening in our generation. Like I went to India in '75, so we then I'd come back in '83, in '77, then come back in '83, then '87. So we we're seeing these differences, and more and more people. Uh, village and farm people were moving um, on the on the upward ladder, so to speak, getting educated and then leaving their families and going into high tech jobs or engineering jobs or accounting jobs and moving into the city and living in crowded cities on becoming a sardine on a bus or a train <clears throat> and competing with a thousand people for one job and you know if you don't want to work twelve hours a day, there's another guy he'll work fourteen. And he's waiting in line for your job. So that's what they left. And they left their parents and family. And, you know, they're making money, sending it back. Cost of living is going up, so then it's costing more in the village. But if you go back, before that happened, so we, you know, when we first went to India, when you go to Vrindavan, there's nothing there. It's a simple village. If somehow everybody's okay. There's enough food. Everybody's living. It's you know, a lot living in luxury, but living... And now you see what's happening, and the village is becoming polluted and overrun by real estate. And, you know, within 30 miles of Vrindavan, there's all kinds of technical schools, and the whole thing has changed. In the we are seeing, in India, those of us who are in India, we're seeing what happened in America maybe 100, 150 years ago. We, we saw that in the 70s and 80s in real time. And, of course, you still see it, but now it's seeing 100,000 other cars within your... You know, and, and inhaling their fumes while it takes you about an hour <clears throat> during rush hour to go a mile. And, and um, it's good to look at it that way, you know, to understand the history of what we've created. Now, can we go back? I don't know. Would it be better? Maybe we could go back in a different way. Maybe not exactly the same, but in a way that would work. But I had this question. I wrote a book, and I put this question in the book. And I think it's a good question, and I'll ask it to you. And then you could ask some questions. Let's see. If I said, what if I discovered a pill? And if you took this pill, it would increase your focus four times. It would increase your energy four times. It would increase your determination four times. It would increase your ability four times. And it would increase your intelligence four times which basically means whatever it is you want to do, you're going to do it not four times faster, but maybe 16 times faster because you have, or maybe hundreds of times 
when it synergizes with all that increase of focus, intelligence, determination, willpower, ability. So, so the idea is, whatever it is that you and I want to do, we're going to do it infinitely fast. Maybe not infinitely, but let's say, let's say, we'll do it ten. We're going to speed everything up ten times because this drug has empowered us to be ten times more productive. So now. This drug is available to the world. It's made free. Governments around the world <clears throat> are giving this drug free. It's an inexpensive plant, we discovered. So everyone now is working 10 times more efficiently. They're, they're 10 times more productive. And so my question to you is, should we allow this drug on the market? Because if at the rate we're, this is my theory, if at the rate we're going, we multiply it by 10 times, then we're going to crash 10 times faster. Everyone's 10 times more, okay, if Steve Jobs were 10 times more productive, we'd be 10 times more disconnected right now. He would have come out of his products a lot earlier, and they would have evolved a lot faster. So instead of us waiting till we were like 60 before we had an iPhone, maybe we could have had it when we were like my generation, 45. And we could have got addicted to our phones a lot earlier and a lot messed, uh, more messed up and messed up relationships a lot earlier. You know, I'm being sarcastic, but you understand, understand my point. So it's an interesting meditation. It's an interesting question. I haven't asked people in public, but um, it's such an interesting question because if someone says things would be worse, then that begs the question, how do you define progress? Because everything which we call progress, if that's making things worse, it's better we slow it down, or it's better we don't make progress. So Prabhupada's ideas are revolutionary, and not everybody can completely understand them right now, because it, he seems to be saying we should go back to a system that people think didn't work. But most people don't know how it worked or whether or not it worked, because they weren't living that way. They were in that system. And we don't have, you know, 150-year-old people to ask, well, well, how do you think the world today compares to your world that you grew up in? But some research can be done, and it definitely uh, seems that Prabhupada is saying and wanted us to go back to that. He didn't have faith in this current system, unless you can inject Krishna into it and start to simplify things. Maybe not go back to an agrarian agrarian culture for the mass of the population, but go back to something more simple. Maybe starting by everybody in their backyard, grow, their, grow as much food as they can, and the government allowing people to have wells and you know, generate their own power, <clears throat> and um, limiting in some way the things we don't need and you know, that kind of thing. But the problem, one of the biggest problems we're facing in our society today is that simplicity would undermine the economy. And so these are difficult things because if you say, you say, okay, I like your idea, but your idea would destroy the economy. And, and that's true. It would, you would need a different economy. But at the same time, you could say, but what we're doing today is going to destroy the economy, and you're not even going to be ready for it when it happens. At least, if we destroy our economy gradually, we can then evolve into a different kind of economy. But uh, could that happen? How that could happen? That requires um, um, yeah, it requires Brahmins. And anyway, this is what Prabhupada wanted us to, to discuss and think about, isn't it? But um, I, I, I spent a little time in Mexico the last few weeks, and then I, just three weeks before that, before I went to Mexico, I was in China for a month. So, as we know, China is this huge metropolis, expanding. And um, you know, the interesting thing about China, it's a traditional culture, and the people, I don't, I mean, maybe they understand what's going on, but I didn't really pick up on that they think what's going on is going to crash at some point. It's not the way to go. I don't get that impression in India because the, the, the country is, is growing economically in a way they've never grown before. And it seems that the people think this is good, but 
When you're sitting in a car, in your car, in the middle of Delhi traffic, to me, I can't imagine anybody thinking that what we did, because it produced this, was actually good. But I think people, they're thinking that way. They don't, they think that going back to the land is, is, is just going back to poverty and, you know, and Prabhupada's saying, no, it's wealth. You just have your, your wealth. Your wealth is not in paper currency. It's in natural resources. So, we'll, <coughs> next week we'll talk more about the cow. I'm not an economist. I think I am. Um, I think I'm smart. But actually, I, I don't want to pose myself as an economist because I haven't actually studied it. I'm only, I'm only observing what I'm seeing in my travels in the world. Uh, another thing I'm seeing, which concerns me, is that, and I can't say this is a conscious effort being done by people who want to make the world a certain way. It could just be happening naturally, or it could be by design. But countries where land was very cheap 30 years ago, and you could live very simply. Uh, you could have some land, farm it. You could live, you could raise a family just doing that. You could be a high school teacher. Uh, one, one parent, a high school teacher, the other parent staying home. You could actually live, you, you, know, you didn't need much. And in, those, in those traditional countries, usually you had just inherited the home of your parents. So you weren't paying rent. Those countries, at that time, very few people had cars. You had very low overhead. Um, and buses were everywhere. So what I'm seeing now in those same countries is land and the cost of living are, are coming up almost close to what it's costing to live in the Western world. Not at the same as the cost of America's, because America's a bit off the charts but other Western countries, whereas some of these countries were extremely poor, it was easy to live, becoming more and more of a struggle. Things are becoming, foods become, you know, when food becomes more expensive, it's, it's, I feel it's like demoniac, like the, the government needs to control that. Because it's almost like in America, if you want to eat healthy, you have to have a good income if you want to eat organic. Because if you're going to eat organic and you have a family, of three or four, you're, you're probably going to be spending twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, and you want to get vitamins and so forth a month just on food, which is like three hundred would be like what it used to be normal. So I'm seeing this not just in one place, but I'm seeing this more and more around the world. The cost of living is going up. So what does that mean when the cost of living is going up? Well. You want to live simply, but it's more difficult because it's more expensive. So you're kind of forced into working in areas you may not want to work, or you're just forced subconsciously to think when you're, when you're educated, where's the money? What can I do that will make money? Not, what can I do that I should do? That would be the best contribution. And even if you want to live simply, like now in America, the, the cost of living between living simply and not living so simply is not a whole lot. It's still expensive to live simply in America. So, with inflation, the cost of living, and so forth, that's it's going on everywhere around the world, getting worse and worse. Some places, you know, economies have crashed, so it's different, but that's a double-edged sword. If the economy crashes, you can't get a job, or the job doesn't pay much. Anyway, it's becoming harder and harder to live a simple life, which is unfortunate. And it's forcing people to have to work harder to maintain themselves, to have to, like, kind of forcing them to get in the system. You have to do this. If you don't do this, you won't be able to pay your bills. And so people are getting on this treadmill, even the ones who don't want to. And that's, that's unfortunate. And you'll, you'll see, like, if you, if you just inquire in your travels when someone's living in a home and it's been there 30 years and say, well, how much does it cost to build this home? And they'll give you some ridiculous price. Like, well, it cost us like, well, back in 83, it cost us about $7,000. 
So that means it's paid for, right? Yeah, it's paid for. We paid for it long ago. Now, what would that home cost you to build? Well, now, same home, about 60000 65000 Okay, that's a little bit of a chunk of money for someone in a little third world country. It's not even, you know, that's an expensive house in America. But still, it's something. So this is what we're seeing. That, you know, and how hard was it to get that 7000 30 years ago? Not that hard. But now, it's hard to get that 60000 70000 that you need. Much harder to get that. Yeah. Anyway, you understand what I'm saying. Do you have any questions? Um, this, this, what we're reading from here? This, what are we reading from? The 16th chapter, first canto. It talks a lot about this. Um, so, yeah, oh, we went over time. I didn't know we went over time. Okay, I think we've gone long enough, right? Are you satisfied? Did you get enough depressing news today? Um, yeah. Maybe I should get a cow. I have so much land. Now there's no grass to eat. Okay, you want to see my land? Okay, let's go. Let's go outside, everybody. Sure. Hold on. And you're going to look at this and go, oh yeah, you should have a cow. You have so much land. All right. Talk to my wife about a cow. We have a garden. You want to see the garden? Okay, here it is. Oops. There's the land, everybody. Two. This is our neighbors. So they have that land, and half of that's ours. And this is where we just had the... Back in the sec other half is the studio, and that's my office. And this is the other neighbors. They have 10 acres. <clears throat> and they planted all those trees so they wouldn't have to see us. Hare Krishnas. And, um, yeah, we could have a lot of cows, right? What do you think? Yes? You like it? You want to come? We'll take you to the garden. Yeah, I'm supposed to do it like this, right? Like the vloggers? Okay. Okay, all you green thumb people, I'll show you what we did. Not a big garden, but something. Anybody want to come out here and you know how to farm? We'll give you three acres. We'll keep one for ourselves. You're going to have four acres. 49th anniversary? Who's that? 49th anniversary of what? Marriage? What, your parents were married when they were two? What? 49th anniversary, what? Initiation? This month is my 49th anniversary of uh, I first became a uh, to the temple. Okay, here's our little garden. I don't know if you can see it all because I'm backwards. Can you see? Lettuce. Should we go in? Should we go in? Hold on. It, whoa, it's actually my wife's project. She just, sometimes I help her. Whoops, trying to get in. Okay. I think, okay, I'm gonna turn it around, so. If I turn it around, if I can, yeah, let's see, okay, so I think those are carrots there, oh, look at this, this is Moringa, if you eat Moringa, it's amazing, installation of Radha Lendish on 49th, oh wow, 
So, this is, I don't even know what all this is, but just so you know, when I was talking about living off the land, we're doing something. Of course, we end up spending more money growing it than buying it, I don't know. So we have these beds, you see? That's to prevent the weeds. And we have this bed here. And a lot of lettuce here. So, you're welcome to come out here and you can grow more. We're going to be in India and come here and grow more. And then here's our land. It goes all around. There's a forest and there's about 10 acres behind those trees. And then, if you, you go up this way, there's a like 100 acre forest on the other side. And our neighbors um, are devotees from San Diego, who I've known for 30 or more years, 35. And we have this